Welcome to the Granny's film, Filming Studio, and we are here today with our exciting new project, Out of the Blue. And we have pieces put together, a few, so you can kind of get a hint of what the project is going to be like. And when yesterday, all of the packages in the first session uh, were shipped. Uh, Liz, our, our helper in the office, shipped them all out yesterday and they went out in exciting bags and it was such a fun morning here at Granny's Legacy. And Katie, tell me, are, is the first session full yet? There are, I believe, just a few spots remaining in the first session. And then the, we are taking orders for the second session. So it was so exciting. We thank all of you for um, loving this project and wanting to do it as much as we did. So this is what looks, what will come in the mail for you all um, people that have signed up. It's a big package. So it's your beginning kit and your center block. And so I'm gonna open it up here and we're going to kind of go through the first steps and give a little hints and tricks to help your project go better. If you still need anything as far as tools, to work on your project, please give us a call on Monday, 507-377-0777. Uh, uh, and Liz can get those sent right out to you. So if you're still needing something to make your project go better, um, please let us know. So this is what's going to come and the directions will tell you what all of these things are for. So this is their center medallion block and I'm gonna set that aside right now because we're going to have to prepare our background fabric. This does not have to be washed. We're gonna use it as is. It's kind of hard when I work on an angle here so the camera can see. But the big piece of wool has two salvages. So the salvages are what you're going to be concentrating on when you do your piece. So the first one is going to tell you in the directions, it will give you a little diagram on how to cut this wool. So this is a piece of paper. It's general instructions and please keep these handy. Don't pack them away because you're going to need them for all six sessions. So this is out of the blue general project instructions. So these you're always going to need. So don't pack them away. You're going to need those for every single session, section. So this is our preparedness sheet for the first background. And Katie is such a good pattern, pattern writer. She has given you a diagram. So this diagram is your wool and it says salvage edge and this is my salvage edge. And it shows me I'm going to need a 14 inch strip. So I'm gonna put this at on my uh, cutting mat and I am going to snip right through the salvage, one snip at 14 inches. And then once you get that snip, you can rip this wool and you will create a long strip. So this will be on your piece of wool. You will give it a snip and then you will tear it all the way across and you get a 14 inch strip. And that's what we're going to be working with in this section. We need a 14 inch square, but you can go ahead and rip and cut all of your sections for the whole piece, or you can do them one at a time, however you like. So that's how you prepare. Don't be afraid to tear your wool. It'll tear with the grain. If it's a little wonky, you can always, and I'll show you on that. If it comes out a little wonky, I'll show you how we're going to square that up but we need a 14 inch square. So we're going to put that again on the cutting mat and we're gonna clip that salvage off and then I need 14 inches. So I'm gonna snip on the 14. I'm gonna remove the salvage and you'll see, this is kind of frightening at first, but it gives you such a nice piece of wool to work on. So now I have my 14 inch square. Now, if my square had been a little wonky, you can take the corners and just give it a stretch 
and it'll square itself right back up again. Sometimes it can become wonky when they stretch them on the roll at the factory, but you can square that up just by tugging on those corners. So that is preparing your first center. And then what I like to do is put it back on the mat and I want to find the center and I'm going to put a pin because I need, I'm not open yet. Okay, what I need to do is I need to find the center. So I'm gonna put a, a pin on this and a pin on this side. On the, do you need to put your weft on? I, we will put okay. the weft on. We definitely will put the weft on. And, but we will, I will show you how I want to get that lined up and find, I want to make that into quadrants. Now, on mine, when I did mine, I used a chalk pencil and I drew the quadrant, but by the time I had pressed all my background pieces onto the quadrant, the chalk had kind of turned into permanent chalk paint. So I don't recommend marking it out with chalk. Use a couple pins and give your quadrants. So that's what we're going to do that way. So like Katie said, we need to put the heat, the uh, ultra weft on the back of your square. So I'm gonna pretend this is my square now. And there's also directions for the ultra weft. This is a stabilizer, it's a woven stabilizer. One side will feel kind of sugary or sandy or grainy. That's the glue. So that glue goes on the back side of your wool. And as far as I'm concerned, there is no back or front side to this white wool. But I'm going to put that grainy side down onto the wool so it's in between. And it doesn't hurt to use your pressing sheet here to cover your piece. Um, it's going to protect your wool. Sometimes your iron will kind of want to stick to that ultra weft, so it's a good idea to cover that with a pressing seat. So we're imagining this is the big 14 inch square, okay? And we're just going to use a good hot iron and press that on and it creates a nice bond on your wool. And it's permanent, it doesn't come off. And it, that is the back of your wool now. And it gives you a nice, stable foundation to do your work on. Can you flip it over again? So this is the ultra weft side. Mm -hmm. And it's stuck on there good. It doesn't want to come off. If it's coming off, you haven't used enough heat. So go back to your ironing surface and put a little bit more heat on it and it will really secure to the back of your wool. And that gives you a wonderful, just a wonderful foundation to work on, on this piece. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about press and seal wrap. Now, if you've done any of Granny's projects in the past, you know we do love the press and seal and people have a love-hate relationship with it. And we also have that same love-hate relationship. But we, we find that the results are so wonderful that we're gonna go with the love side and forget the hate side. But this is Press and Seal, and it's in the grocery store in the Saran Wrap section. Just make sure it says Press and Seal, and it's sticky on one side. On the back side, it's sticky, and you can kind of hear as my finger comes off of it. And that's what we love about Press and Seal, is that sticky surface. So I will take a piece, and I will pretend that I'm going to be laying out my foundation, and I'm just going to make a little square to go on this here so that I'm not working on such a big piece in front of the camera. But in your instructions for week, the center section, it will show a tracing sheet. So you will put, I will show you that tracing sheet. If I can get it out of the bag. Diane does such a nice job of packaging this. Isn't that beautiful? Aren't you excited to get your project? So that is section one woolens, and I'm gonna set that aside. But in the pattern, there will be a tracing sheet that is specifically for your press and seal. And if you prefer to use a light box, that would might work for you too. 
but there's different color combinations and the blue dots are going to be basting stitches for the layout of the tree or the stem so that we'll base those so we'll know exactly how those lay on the sheet the orange lines are the yellow um, uh, outline stitching so I'm just going to take and just do one of these just for fun you just lay your press and seal so your press and seal wrap will cover the whole thing and then with a black sharpie or an ink pen um, I've discovered an ink pen does not ever come off and an it doesn't ink pen. smear it's weird an ink pen doesn't smear it doesn't come off it won't smear off on your hands but you just trace right over that and I don't have an ink pen here with me so I'm going to use a good old black sharpie but you might want to use an ink pen just a regular ballpoint ink pen and it can be blue you'll be able to see it and so that will pull right off of there and then you're going to align it onto your background and this is where so the, they're, they're, the, they're tracing the dot the blue dot lines and the you will trace oh let me do this so you will put your piece on here Stick it right on your sheet and don't be afraid to make it stick down. And then using your marker, I strongly suggest marking these edges, these four edges, so you know how to align it onto your wool. And then you will dot, dot, dot out all the basting on the whole thing. And you'll do a careful job, not like I'm doing here. And you'll trace all of the orange lines. And so you'll know that the dotted lines are basting and the trace lines are, are embroidery. And Katie has uh, directions, the orange line stem, stitchy, stem stitch using size eight V106 pearl cotton. The blue dotted lines based using pearl cotton, or you can use just a cotton thread. You can use anything for the basting because it's going to be covered up, so it doesn't really matter. So she has very clear instructions. So once you have traced your whole piece, then you're going to come back to your square and you put ultra weft on the back of your section. And then you'll lay that out and it'll be really easy to lay it out because you've got this and we have this lines up with this and this lines up with this, this lines up with this and the bottom lines up with that and then you'll start your stitching. So that is really so simple um, for layout. So now I'm going to work on this little square because it's much easier in the camera to see a little square. So I've got some V106 gold and this happens to be a size 8. That's something new to grannies. We don't often use the size 8. It's a, a thicker thread, but we loved the texture it gave our project. So we're working outside of our usual box and we're going to be using the V106 size 8 and we're also going to use the M5 in a size eight. And so these two balls, you want to take and separate them from the rest of your work because these are the two that are the thicker threads and so we'll use these in a different place. So now, here we have a scissors. I was looking for my little snips. So I've threaded my needle and I find that I can still thread the V106 size eight through my general on um, number seven embroidery needle. And I like to put a knot in the end first because once you put the thread wax on, it's hard to get that knot in the bottom. My thread wax is almost gone but I just put my thumb on top of it and put a little pressure on it and pull it through. And that thread wax is so wonderful. It really protects the thread from fraying or from wearing out as you do your stitching. Also, I have a tendency when I start a new thread, I get a lot of knots as I work and that keeps it from knotting up from me. 
So now we're just going to go and we're going to stitch right through that press and seal wrap. So I'm going to do a few stitches here and the only reason I'm going to do a few stitches and I'm not going to be too careful or or um, try to be too, this is just for teaching purposes so that you can see how easily it removes. Now when you do your basting, it won't remove quite as easy if you use great big huge stitches. You might want to even you could eat if it were me I just went to the sewing machine and used a regular stitch length on my sewing machine and I did these all on my sewing machine and the press and seal wrap fell right away from it then because there were so many holes from the stitching from the sewing machine that it's like serration on paper if it's serrated a lot it it comes off easily if you try to tear paper that has just a few serrations it just kind of rips apart not so fun so the more holes you have in your work as you stitch if you take tinier stitches that press and seal wrap is really gonna come off a lot easier so we're going to pretend now that I'm you probably don't want to watch me stitch this whole piece but I'm stitching right through the wrap I'm stitching all the way to the back of my work and if it doesn't come all the way through the, the all the stitches come all the way through I don't get too concerned about that I just want to make sure it comes through the white portion for sure I'm gonna go and stitch another one of these arms on this Katie do I need to come around to the front or can nope, you see you're okay just fine. all right I don't want to be doing this so that the camera can't see what's going on. I usually would not go from here to here. I would not often go, but just for the sake of time, I just went underneath my project. I do tend to travel underneath a little ways if I have a piece that I don't have to travel very far, but if I have to travel more than say an inch, I would knot it off and start with start again. I don't like to travel on the back of my work very far because it tends, when I travel too far, and this is a good example of me traveling too far. Do you see how it puckered that work? Does it show in the camera? A little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's a good idea not to travel too far if, if that's the problem you have. So I'm going to knot that off and then I'm going to just show you how simple it is for that heat press and seal. I always want to call it heat and bod, but it's press and seal. To rip off so I've got my stitching so you will be doing your stitching and as you can see some of these have been laid out and are just starting to stitching so I'm doing this yellow stitching line and then it gives me a perfect layout for my other pieces so you can see how easily this can be be removed sometimes if you put your thumb on your work it'll remove but I'm not going to do that so you can see but did you see how that tore right on the edge of that and then I'll tear back down. And sometimes if you just pull against it diagonally, see how easily that came off? And it's important to use a little bit stitches. Don't try to use great big stitches. If you do like larger stitches, and sometimes the, your project calls for it or your own signature stitch is going to be that way. If you do happen to like larger stitches before you tear it off, you can always take a darning needle and go along it and then usually it will tear easier along that line. I'll see if I can get it to tear so just perforate it. Perforate it I wonder if with one a of those, heavy needle. Those old fashioned, you know those, I used to think it looked like a little pizza cutter that they used for uh, pattern marking. Oh, pattern marking. I wonder if you took that and just ran it over. Like, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. What is that? You probably know. You used one in your Yeah, own. some kind of a little dial marker mm -hmm. yeah something like that so think outside of the box if you're having trouble getting that press and seal to come off of your project because as you can see it is really an aid in layout so now as i have these pe this layout i can refer to my next pattern sheet and katie does such a wonderful job so you will trace your just follow your general instructions you will trace all of this on heat and bond and I will give you a little hint that I do 
I cut my heat and bond on my pressing mat to exactly eight and a half by 11. It can't be less or more. You have to be very particular about cutting it. But you can put it through your laser copy machines and you can just put, put inkjet. Inkjet, not inkjet, laser. Not laser. Not laser. Your inkjet ink copy machines. You can just put this right in your copy machine, put the, the heat and bond light in the paper tray or the self feeder, and you can just run these through and you don't have to do all that tracing. If you have a if you're using a machine that has toner rather than ink cartridges. It uses heat to set the toner and it will melt your heat and bond. So you have to make sure you have ink cartridges and an inkjet. So there's the hint. You have to have an inkjet copy. And some of you have heard our horror story about when we used our laser copy machine to copy. Because I just love that. So once you get your pieces cut out, we're just going to pretend that this is a layout sheet. And I'm, I usually take, and Katie does too, we take and we um, just put all the pieces in numerical order and we just put them all on a pin. So as we feed them off the pin, they're ready to go. So then I would just look one, and you can put it right, we'll pretend that this is the branch. So we can put it right on there. Two, and this is number three. And you can just carry on like that. This is number four, and you'll take the paper off the back and lay them out. And then once you get it laid out, just right, just how you like it. We love the cool pins. You can take cool pins and put them in on the diagonal, just like this, and hold everything in place just the way you would like it. And the reason for cool pins is what makes cool pins different. The Teflon on the head does not melt when your hot, hot, hot iron hits it. So I would take the cool pins and I put them in very horizontally. And then, let's see if I get my iron, is it still hot? We'll wake it up a little bit here. It tends to go to sleep. So using your layout sheet, um, it's really nice because once you get your um, press and seal pulled off you'll know right where the stems go you'll know right where everything goes this is just so fun to have that layout ready for you now I cannot express to you how important a pressing sheet is going to be on this project if you do not have one I, I can't tell you, you really need to find something even if you don't have a granny's pressing uh, pressing affair you need some kind of protection on this wall, and I will show you why. I'm going to take, and with my hot iron, if this were my project and I were gonna iron this on and use a little bit of steam, iron it. let's see if we can get the iron turned on a little bit. So um, you're gonna wanna steam those on and keep get those steamed on good. And as you go over your project. And you are demonstrating why you would not use a pressing affair right now. Because normally you would have that covered with a pressing I affair. I would always leave a pressing affair on. I think I turn my iron off instead of on. So we'll wait for it to heat up a little bit. But when if I take and put my hot iron on this, I got a wrinkle there. If I put my hot iron right on this wool, it will scorch. And I'm going to kind of show you an example of that um, here as soon as my iron heats up. Okay, I'm just going to put it on the edge here. And I'm going to pretend I've got something underneath of there. And as you iron on that, and then right now my iron's behaving and it's not going to scorch it. But you can scorch that so quickly. And it's, it's golden and it's brown and you've ruined your wool. And it's a pretty expensive piece of wool to ruin. So, um, of course, in demo purposes, it's not going to scorch for me. But So I use a pressing affair. Pressing affairs are nice. You can see through them. The steam will go through them. If something isn't in its place, you can make sure it's in its place. And then with a hot iron with steam, and you can get it a, give it a couple poofs of steam. Now my iron's hot. Now it's going to work. And then you go back and take out your cool pins, pull them right out, 
Everything's exactly in its place where it's supposed to be. Stuck on really good. If you need to, after you remove the pins, you can go back and give it one more poof. Less is better. Do a little bit at a time. Don't try to do too much at once. And that's stuck right on there. I'm gonna, now my iron's hot. I'm gonna show you if I was going to use this without a pressing affair, some irons have hot spots and they will create a brown spot right there on your wool. So you will, don't take a chance, use something, use a old uh, uh, cotton dish towel or a, a, um, even a paper towel, a very damp paper towel will work. So that is how you're going to lay out and then you'll be ready to do your stitching. So we, um, that kind of explains the general how to get your pieces on. Um, you can follow the directions on how to do your stitching. Katie has done a wonderful job using, she'll say use this color thread and a blanket stitch or this color thread and a colonial knot or this color thread and lazy daisy. Every step of the way she has in the pattern. So you will find that as you lay it out and you have it all ready to go, it will have very clear instructions that will tell you, let's say we're gonna do the butterfly. And some of them you need to refer to your basic project instructions too. Mm -hmm. So on the blueberries, it says stitch following the directions on your general project sheet. So if it's something you're gonna use in every single section, she's got them in the general project sheet. So you will refer her back to the blue blossoms on your general project sheet. So, I think we call them blueberries and blue blossoms. Okay, there we go. Yes, so blueberries, blueberries, blue blossoms, blue blossoms. So, anyhow, you can follow those instructions really, really clearly, step by step, and you will have a perfect project in the end. Now, when you go to square up your project, I just wanted to give one hint on squaring up before we left here today. And the squaring up process, I'm just gonna grab one from the bottom here, just to show a little trick when squaring up. So when you wanna square this up, this is going to be squared up to seven by seven, this, this particular one. You haven't gotten to this block yet. But when you square up to seven by seven on these pieces that have your embroidery, your, your ruler is gonna wobble back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So what I usually do is I will press down on this side and be more concerned. I will use my mat as the cutting, not the ruler as the cutting. Uh, and that's opposite of what we usually do when we're cutting cottons. But the reason we need to use our mat is because of the thickness of the applique. So I will get my piece centered where I want it. And then I will take and I will trim. I will push down on the edge of the ruler. Because if you try to push here, it wobbles and you'll get a wavy line. So you need to push on the edge of your ruler and then you take your rotary cutter, and I love these stick cutters for squaring up because they're easier to control. So you just take and trim along that edge, and then I'm using my, my mat as the squaring up. So I've got, even if you had to do it over here so you know you're marking the right size or put a little um, pencil mark where you wanna be cutting so you don't accidentally cut in the wrong spot. So you're gonna wanna do some some planning, mark it out so you don't cut the wrong, don't cut on the wrong line. You know, put a piece of tape on your mat where you're gonna be cutting or something. And then just use, put your pressure on the ruler close to the edge. And I know you're gonna to have to keep your fingers out of the way and just use your cutter to do it that way. Because if you try to push here, your, your ruler will wobble back and forth, back and forth. So that's a little hint on squaring up those pieces to get them so perfectly, perfectly square. 
So this one is seven by seven, exactly. And when I did it, I actually took a little pencil and I wrote, did a mark on my wool so I knew where I was cutting. Because this was a scrap here, so I put a little mark here because I knew I was going to be cutting it off. And then I had a little mark out here on the wool because I knew I was going to be cutting it off. So I'll, I'll do an example on this piece. So let's say I wanted it to be, and I'm going to even be brave and use that big black Sharpie. So I know that I'm going to be using these lines and these lines. So I'm going to put a little mark here and a little mark here and a little mark here and a little mark here, 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 here. So now I know I won't get confused when I go to cut that. And I will, well, I've got some pins in the way here. Let's move them out of the way there. So now I can go and I can line up my ruler and know exactly which lines I'm cutting off here because I don't want to make the mistake of cutting on the wrong line. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Those stick cutters are awesome. They are nice. So that, that kind of helps me. I still have my dot here so I know this is my line here. This last dot here is going to be the tricky one. So. Um, you'll have to remember that last dot because as you cut this you might forget that so we might we could go part way here so we mark that and then go this way be creative you know then do this one so we know if you don't remove them they'll still be there and then you've got that perfect perfect square on your to be stitching on so that's another hint for the squaring up that I can give you. So I hope that we've given you a nice um, overview of your layout and your first section. Please send us in any questions you have and we will be posting every week on the Out of the Blue Facebook post. So if you have questions during the week as you're working, please post them. There might be someone else with the same question and we'd love to answer those questions for you. So thank you again for joining Out of the Blue and enjoy your pro project.